What I'm going to show you in this video can save you thousands of dollars a year. I pay between $250 and $300 to DigitalOcean every single month for a Kubernetes cluster. When I lived in Chile, that sort of made sense. I needed stuff to be hosted close to people in the US, and DigitalOcean is way cheaper than Amazon. If you want to see for yourself, here's a link you can follow to get $100 credit for 60 days. I'll put it in the video description too. So now that I'm back in the US, I have gigabit fiber in my house, and I want to start hosting production stuff on the Kubernetes cluster that I have here. So here's what we're going to build. Out in DigitalOcean, I'm going to deploy a single node K3S cluster. That cluster will run Traffic Proxy, and it's going to act as the ingress for traffic from the internet. In my home, I'll run another K3S cluster. It doesn't have to be K3S. It can be anything at all. I want to connect these two clusters so that traffic from the edge cluster gets routed to services in the home cluster. Sounds easy, right? Now, there are a bunch of ways to do this that are already out there, and I spent the last month testing all of them. I tried Kilo, then Lico, then Submariner, or Submariner, depending on who you talk to. I even tried Cilium Cluster Mesh. The problem with each of these is that they expect both clusters to have routable, stable public IP addresses, and if they don't, then they expect each node to have a stable public address with ports forwarded. My ISP can't assign me a block of static addresses because whoever created their new billing system forgot to build that in as a feature. They don't know when it's going to be available, and I don't want to keep waiting because every month that passes is another $300 up in smoke. I want to be able to connect multiple machines, and I don't want to do port forwarding off of my router either. Port forwarding feels icky. And with multiple machines behind a single address, well, things that expect to build a multi-node mesh, they just completely fall apart. The key to easy NAT traversal is tail scale. This creates a mesh VPN between multiple devices across NATs with no port forwarding. Now, at first, I thought that that was just one and done, but it turns out that it's not as easy as it sounds. I discovered while testing everything again on top of tail scale that it's quite difficult to get Kubernetes to use the tail scale address as its primary IP. Even when I convinced it to do so, things would sometimes slip and they'd go out over the primary host IP and not out over the tail scale network. Submariner was the only solution that worked, but I didn't like that I was then running an overlay network on top of an overlay network. Submariner is also complicated, and the more complex that something is, the more likely I'm going to have to spend time keeping it running. Now, I had almost given up when Shipwreck pointed me at an October article on the Tailscale blog that presented several ways to run Tailscale inside of a Kubernetes cluster, and that was when the magic started to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to attach a sidecar to traffic out in DigitalOcean, and we're going to connect just that pod to the Tailscale network. Inside of the home cluster, we'll run a pod that acts as a subnet router for Tailscale. That pod will announce the service CIDR block from the local cluster. Those are the IPs where services run. The sidecar container will hear these routes, and traffic will be able to consume services that are running inside of the home cluster. When all is said and done, my bill from DigitalOcean should drop from $300 a month to just $15 a month. There's a Kubernetes native solution called Inlets that claims to be able to do all of this without forwarding ports, but I don't want to pay $20 a month on top of the cloud instance costs. I also don't want to be limited to the number of tunnels or the number of clusters that I can have, and I want to do it all with free and open source tooling for as cheap as possible. Tailscale has a generous free tier that includes 20 devices and a single subnet router. And if I need more than that, I'm totally fine with paying them 50 bucks a year because there are other tremendous benefits that come with running a Tailscale mesh. There are some things that you'll need to follow along with this video. First, you'll need one node out in the cloud somewhere. That can be a DigitalOcean or it can be anywhere else. Here's that link again. We're going to build that into a single node K3S cluster that acts as the doorway to our local cluster. For the local cluster, you'll need one or more nodes somewhere else. For me, that's going to be here in my house. I'm building a single node K3S cluster for this video, but after I'm done, I'll tear that down and I'll build a new multi-node cluster that I'll migrate all of my production workloads to. I'm going to use Ketchup to install the clusters over SSH. It's still the best way to install K3S, but watch out. As of this recording, it's still pinned to the 1.19 version of K3S when the stable channel is on 1.21. So I'll show you how to handle that when we do the install. Since we're working with Kubernetes, you'll also need the kubectl command on your local system. I alias that to k, and I recommend that you do the same. You'll see me use a couple of other shortcuts. I type kcc when I'm switching kubectl contexts, and I type ns when I'm switching namespaces. 
Both of these are aliases from the kubi command, which you can find at this link. kcc is an alias for kubectx, and ns is an alias for kubiNS. Those two commands alone will save you a huge amount of time. Kubi creates a subshell and changes the prompt. So you'll be able to tell if I'm working with the edge or the local cluster, and you'll also be able to see which namespace I'm in. For most commands, I'll also just include the namespace in the command just to be clear where the manifest is being applied. I use the fish shell, but you might use bash or ZSH or something else. Each shell sets and pastes variables differently. So if you copy a shell command directly from the video, you might have to change the syntax slightly for your shell. All of the commands and the manifests that I'm using are in the channel resources at this link. There's a readme there that I'm following along with. You'll have to make some minor changes to reflect your own CIDR blocks and public addresses, but for most of the video, all of the FQDNs are using sslip.io. Even if you don't have your own DNS server, you'll be able to do everything except the very last section. For the last section, which demonstrates an optional way to handle TLS certificates with Let's Encrypt, you'll need a domain with DNS that you control. You'll also need an account with Tailscale. To set that up, go to tailscale.com and log in with your GitHub credentials. You'll be able to do everything in this video with the free tier. All set, let's get started. We're going to start with the local cluster. I'll be using a host called demo-a with the address 10.68.0.70. Let's kick off that install and then I'll explain the command that I'm using. I'm asking Ketchup to install K3S on the host demo-a. It will SSH in as the root user. I want Ketchup to pass some additional commands to the K3S installer. I'm setting a specific block of addresses for the service and pod networks. This is necessary for routing between the clusters. The networks must be different. If you're doing this on a cluster that already exists, then you only need to make sure that the edge cluster is different. In my case, since I'm building it from scratch, I'm setting non-default CIDR blocks for both of them. I said earlier that Ketchup is still using 1.19 as the default Kubernetes version. By passing K3S channel equals stable, it will use whatever the current stable channel is for K3S. Today, that's 1.21. Finally, I'm asking Ketchup to bring down the kubectl config file and save it as config.yaml in the local directory, referring to this cluster as local. I'll attach to that kubeconfig file with the kcc alias, and you can see that the local context shows up in the prompt. That makes it easy to see which cluster I'm working with. Now let's move on to the tail scale portion. Normally, when you add a machine to tail scale, you have to authenticate in a browser to accept the machine. Well, it doesn't work for automated deployments, so we're going to create an auth key in Tailscale and provide that when we bring up the Tailscale pods in the clusters. I'm using a reusable key here, but if you prefer, you can also just create a single use key for each host. This cluster is going to run a subnet router, which is a dedicated pod that announces the cluster and pod ciders into the Tailscale network. If I wanted, I could also make it announce the rest of my LAN into the Tailscale network too. The steps to do that are one, create a namespace for the application. Two, create a secret with the auth key. Three, create a service account and apply the RBAC permissions that let it modify the secret. And finally, create the subnet router. Some of you probably just asked, wait, wait, what? Why does it need to modify the secret? In addition to the auth key, the secret is used by the pod to store information about its connection configuration. So after registering with Tailscale, it modifies the secret with this data. Once that pod is up and running, we need to make some final changes in the Tailscale admin interface. Host keys have a default expiration of 90 days, after which the service has to be restarted to renew its keys. Losing this connection or restarting it every 90 days defeats the purpose of what we're trying to build, so we're just going to turn that off. The other thing that we need to do is tell Tailscale what routes to accept from this network. Even though we're announcing the two CIDR blocks, I'm only going to activate the service CIDR. So that's it for the local cluster. Now, let's build out the edge cluster. The install is almost the same as the local cluster, but in addition to changing the CIDR blocks from the default, I'm also disabling traffic probably sounds weird since this cluster is going to use traffic. Why did I just disable it? 
K3S installs traffic by default, but I want to install it myself. This gives me the control to upgrade it when traffic has a new release, and it also lets me control what features of traffic I want to use. For example, at the time of this video, K3S is using traffic 2.4.8, but traffic is currently on 2.5.6. Traffic introduced a change in 2.5 that disables routing to external services, and that's how our system is going to work. So in order to activate that, we'll install traffic via Helm after the cluster is up, and when I do that, I'm also going to put it into its own namespace. The tail scale work for the edge cluster is easy. It's just a matter of creating the traffic system namespace, adding the auth key, and applying the RBAC configuration for the sidecar. The RBAC configuration for the edge cluster uses a different service account than the local cluster used. In the local cluster, we're running the subnet router as its own pod in its own namespace, and that's using a service account named Tailscale. In the edge cluster, we'll be running a sidecar on the traffic pod, and that's already using a service account named Traffic. So instead of creating a new service account, we're adding the traffic service account to a new role that allows it to manage the secret. How many of you are wondering how I'm going to install traffic with Helm, but also attach a sidecar to the pod so that it can connect to the Tailscale network? Is there an option in the traffic chart to add a sidecar? No. Am I going to do it manually after the pod is running? Hell no. That would be fragile. To do this, we're going to take advantage of a Kubernetes feature called a dynamic admission controller. This watches and acts on manifests as they're applied to the cluster. It can do things like deny their admission if they don't adhere to certain rules, mutate them to add or change things to be the way we want, or it can let them through but log and alert. The tool that we're going to use for this is called Kyverno. It's pretty lightweight and it uses YAML for its configuration. Now there are other tools that you could use like OPA Gatekeeper or Kubewarden from SUSE. In fact, I'm a big fan of what Kubewarden is doing, but for this use case, Kyverno is a better fit. Like all things Kubernetes, installing Kyverno is easy with Helm. Let's go over the policy that we're installing. The default action for a new Kyverno install is to not make changes. So we're telling it in this manifest to actually enforce the policy. It's going to match any deployment named traffic, and when it finds one, it's going to mutate it to include an additional container in the spec. That container will use the Monacus slash Tailscale v1.16 image, and it'll also set some environment variables. KubeSecret tells it where to store the additional information that I spoke of earlier. In our case, we're just using the same secret as the auth key. The container needs net admin capabilities to do routing, and because that's enabled down below, we don't want Tailscale to run in user space. So we control that by setting user space to false. The auth key value is pulled from the secret that we created, and we have to use the extra args variable to tell Tailscale to accept the routes that are offered to it by the network. This will connect it to the service cider network that we're announcing from our local cluster. Why am I running my own image? Tailscale offers a container, but it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't have an entry point or a command, so it literally starts and then exits. In their Kubernetes examples, they provide a run.sh file that tells the container what to do and a Docker file that builds the container with it. In order to use the tail scale image, you have to extend it to include that file. Now you are welcome to use the image that I built, or you can build your own from the examples in the tail scale repo. Theirs uses the latest tag. I prefer to pin my images, so I just changed it to use 1.16. Let's install that policy now. With Kyverno in place, we're ready to install traffic. We'll do that with Helm, setting some additional values. Give me a second to kick that off, and then we'll go through the values. We're installing into the traffic namespace, and we're giving traffic permission to use external name services. We have to do that in two places, one for the Kubernetes CRD provider via a flag that the chart accepts, and a second time for the regular Kubernetes ingress provider via an additional arguments flag. The chart, as it exists today, doesn't have a flag for the Kubernetes ingress provider. Now it probably should, so I've opened an issue to have that added. When you do this, check the default chart values.yaml, and you might just be able to set a regular flag. The edge cluster is using the K3S service load balancer. So a load balancer service created for a port will use the host's IP address. We have to tell traffic what that service is called and what namespace it's in so that traffic knows how to report the IP address where it's listening. That service is named traffic and it's in the traffic system namespace. 
Finally, we want to enable TLS on port 443, which Traffic calls Web Secure by default. You can see that Traffic reports two containers in the pod. And if we look at the deployment manifest, we see that it was mutated to include our tailscale sidecar. I did it this way so that I don't have to worry about a change to the chart in the future. As long as the deployment is named Traffic, it'll get mutated the way that I want it to. Back in the tailscale admin panel, we see that the container shows up. So all we have to do is disable key expiration on that machine, and our build is complete. A lot of what Tailscale does is really just magic. You see here that the machine names corresponds to the pod names, right? So you'd think that if you delete a pod and a new one comes up with a different name in its place, that that would be a new machine, but it's not. Tailscale stores the machine ID information in that secret, and that's how the new pod names are mapped to the same configuration. So that means that we don't have to always come in here and reset key expiration every time a new pod gets deployed. Join me in part two where we'll test this setup and then I'll show you two ways to secure it with TLS certificates from Let's Encrypt.